Hello, you're watching Talking About it. I'm John Griffith. Uh, right next to me is not Kara Kilduff. She's actually in the elevator on her way up here, so we will refer to her as the late Kara Kilduff. <laughs> <laughs> and I am joined by two, two dear old friends of mine, uh, Rich and Ted Alexandro. Welcome back. Thank it's you, been a while. It's been, what, about a year and a half, two years since you've been here? Yeah, probably at least two. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And we are, uh, this is, we're kicking off the 20th anniversary year of the show. And we were going over this. Ted, you were my uh, either second or third guest, yeah, along with uh, another uh, comedian whose career obviously went absolutely nowhere because I can't even remember his name. <laughs> <Right>. uh, <laughs> we've, we've grown up together. Pretty much, yeah. yeah. Um, I, I hear some motion in the background. Some baby so steps, yeah. yeah. But uh, the two of you have got a lot going on. You're, you're very community-oriented folks. Um, I just want to bring up, uh, you posted a clip actually online today um, about some of what's going on in the news over the past few weeks. And I do want to bring that up. Um, is there any basic setup? Because we're not going to get audio in here, so if you want to just give a little. Yeah, this is, a, I'm a stand-up comedian, for those who don't know. and uh, Everybody knows. <laughs> And uh, this clip will hopefully make that evident. <laughs> um, this is a set that I recently did at the Comedy Cellar uh, down in uh, the West Village. And uh, I was talking about police brutality and some of the police issues that have been going on lately. Okay, so let's take a look at that. Police brutality came to the fore. Um, I don't think there was necessarily a rise in it. I think um, all of a sudden now we, ha we all have cameras in our pockets. So I think that's kind of what happened. It's not like, wow, the police really had a crazy year. <laughs> it's like, you know, you know, maybe this has been happening a while, but we didn't know about it. And that's part of the disconnect. It's part of the disconnect that people think it doesn't happen to me. So it can't be true. That's the problem. You know, there's a disconnect. Just because something, just because you haven't experienced something doesn't mean that it's not real. Think of police brutality like a Tyler Perry movie. <laughs> you may have never seen one. <laughs> but that doesn't mean they don't exist. You're not the intended audience. S same with police brutality. <laughs> and the other part of the equation, even more importantly, I think, is this uh, implication that we're not allowed to talk about the police. We're not allowed to discuss how they're doing. I'm a comedian. I'm in front of audiences seven nights a week in front of the public, basically saying, what do you think about how I'm doing? Being reviewed moment to moment by the public. You see cars in New York City all over the place, phone numbers on the back, how's my driving? You can just pick up, oh, I don't like that guy's driving. <laughs> <laughs> but somehow we're not allowed to say, uh, it seems like the cops have been killing a lot of black people. I tried to whisper. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know. I don't know what the answers are other than talking, you know, talking out loud sometimes. Sometimes into a microphone, sometimes not. And feeling it, feeling it. Because it's uncomfortable, right? You even feel it here now. Even talking about police brutality is uncomfortable. But at least it's not police brutality. <laughs> Imagine what that must feel like. <laughs> it's better than that. <laughs> Maybe that should be the new program. The cops just come up and talk to black people about police brutality. <laughs> black people are like, this is really uncomfortable. <laughs> Yeah, but we have scaled back. <laughs> <laughs> there you have it. We are joined by the formerly, <laughs> well, still oh, the late Kara Kilduff. Yes, yes. Hi, everyone. You're still watching Talking About. 
this guy is an idiot, and then this guy, stop. Just a couple of idiots. <laughs> These two men. You should know what you got yourselves into. All right, this has nothing to do with what we're going to talk about, but every time I go on um, Paul's page and I see something you guys like, I'm like, God, that's so weird, this degrees of separation. Anyway, that's just for us. <laughs> <laughs> Not for anyone else. I don't care about anyone else. Okay, welcome back. Not true. Welcome back. <laughs> no, really, I'm glad you're watching. Uh, okay, so obviously you're very topical. Yeah, sometimes I am. I mean, you know, we've been involved in activism for the past like three or four years since mm -hmm. Occupy Wall Street, and I did some activism stuff within the comedy community where I organized the comedians for a pay raise, mm -hmm. uh, the New York Comedians Coalition. That was about 2007. Uh, but these last few years has been kind of sustained activism and being involved in different movements. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of found my w its way into my comedy. Uh, I, I, I try not to be too heavy handed, but I try to walk that line of like, you know, because it's, un like I said in, in the thing, it's uncomfortable to talk about, but I feel like if it's compelling and then mm -hmm. I can land the punchlines, it's, it's, it's interesting. Well, how, I, I was watching that and I'm so curious, like how, how is this playing with all different kinds of audiences? Like do you, I mean, you must find differences if you're doing that set outside of the city versus in the city like well you know this is so new that I haven't really done it outside of uh, the five boroughs oh, okay is, yeah so this has been inside of New York but even inside New York it's in different clubs funny. or different <laughs> thanks different rooms you never know the dynamic yeah but over the years I mean I've been doing this 20 years uh, mm -hmm. so over the years you kind of get to the point where you commit to the idea and I know there's going to be moments where it's uncomfortable and I'm okay with that because I think it has merit. So I kind of, yeah, I've learned to kind of plant my feet and, and just mm -hmm. deliver it no matter what room I'm in. I just think it's so interesting that you're a stand-up comic, you're a poet and a rapper, and, it, and it's like, I just love the fact that the two, well, one, that you're brothers, <laughs> but two, that you, you, you feel the same way about these things and you take different avenues to do it. You through humor, like, and, and with what you do. And, and I just find that so interesting that you guys are, you're able to, I don't know, make sense to people and break things down so it's accessible and, you know, um, articulate, which is something I'm struggling with at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> but. Well, we grew up in an, an artistic family um, every one of us went through uh, a community theater. Um, we all write in some capacity or another. My, my sister's an actress. Um, and our mom wrote poetry too a lot when we were kids. Yeah, she was my inspiration to start writing poetry. Um, yeah, so you're right. It's a great avenue to have. Um, of course, you know, he's more accessible. He's on TV, but I, I try to put stuff up and uh, reach people. Um, I put up a poem about my, I guess you could call him my stepson. I never called him my I stepson. I love that poem. I love that poem. That was so good. And that came out very organically. And when it was done, I said to myself, you know, it could break down certain barriers um, because I, I don't know if you read it, John, but no, I, haven't, uh, I, haven't. I, oh, I have idea. goosebumps right now. I was in a relationship with a black woman for 14 years and helped her raise her son for that period of time. Um, then we broke up and I haven't seen her or him for four years. She got oh. married and I, I think her husband really made her change her phone number. I don't know where they are. Um, and New Year's Day was his 18th birthday. So uh, I wrote a poem about that and I included his name is Javon, which, you know, I don't think there's too many white kids named Javon. So <laughs> I, I referenced his name at the beginning, and then I said, well, I'm going to talk about the fact that he's black. Um, and then I asked, you know, can a, can a white man raise a black child, you know? Um, and I think the way it was presented was very accessible to people where, you know, they could relate to it. Um, but maybe, maybe people couldn't. I, Obviously, the people who comment usually are the people that like it, you know. Mm. But who knows? There might have been some people yeah, out there. Yeah, but you know what I loved about that poem? You have to read this. It's mm. really, really good stuff. It, I think it's accessible to anybody who's, who has a, a stepchild or whatever. But the, the line you had about um, how he asked if he could call you daddy, you know, and just, 
it, I love that poem. It just it it does break down barriers, and I think more people need to have access to things like that the, because it's like the things that the two of you talk about. It's real life. It's real experience, yeah. and you know what better way to get a message across than through yeah, with the truth through the arts. You know, I mean that's. Have you seen that poster? I'm sure you have about. Um, it's my screensaver. It says, um, I've beware. Seen screensaver. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> beware of artists. They, they basically, artists hang out with everybody, therefore, they're the most dangerous. Yes. That's right. Yeah. So you guys are like, you know, you dangerous. Very dangerous. <laughs> right now, up in well, Queens. Well, the state is always aware of that uh, and always trying to squelch artists. The more and more fascist uh, a state becomes. Yeah, but if you're using if you're if you're using the arts as a platform, you're using stand up comedy, you're using rapping and you're using performing your poetry as a platform, like you're reaching so many more people and disseminating so many like planting little seeds everywhere and I think that's what they don't like. See I get real you two here making me nerdy. <laughs> <laughs> you make me start thinking and stuff. Plus I had a Snickers bar. <laughs> it's a dangerous combination. Yeah. I know. Well, especially now I mean there's such uh, and anti-arts and anti-anti-intellectualism mentality coming s mostly from the right, but also across the board. Yeah, it keep keep the people dumb and they'll follow. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, one of the things that I was really happy to be part of and to help organize was we did a panel discussion of stand-up comics discussing the Black Lives Matter movement and police brutality and all these issues that have been uh, in the news lately. And uh, we had about nine people on the panel, uh, men and women, um, black, white, Hispanic. Um, and it was not only a panel, but also a town hall discussion. So it was open to the public uh, at the Creek in the Cave in Long Island City. And one of the panelists uh, was Mark DeMeo, who was a retired NYPD detective, as well as a, a stand-up comedian. So uh, his presence in particular, I thought was vital because it brought a whole other perspective than uh, just the folks, you know, the civilians uh, on the panel. Um, and it wound up being a really interesting night um, and a, a very edifying and kind of pretty raw and emotional night, too, because it was just in the aftermath of the non indictment of uh, Officer Pantaleo in the Eric Garner case. Uh, so there was just a lot of really ripe discussion and raw emotional discussion and necessary discussion. Mm. Um, so folks can see that um, that link if you if you look up Creek and the Creek in the Cave Radio uh, Black Lives Matter podcast. Uh, it was I, I felt it was really you know like you like you were talking about they try to squelch discussion mm -hmm. and, and that night was really very open. very open yeah. That's so much better. It makes so much more sense. You know I mean I had a quite I was thinking about. Oh, about this today, I knew I was going to see you guys, and um, I know you were both really involved with Occupy Wall Street, and uh, and now with the Black Lives Matter movement. How, do you see any kind of, I don't know, what the word is, um, um, overlap? Yeah, overlap between the two. I mean, I, I I feel like it's just more people are becoming aware and awake to all kinds of injustice, and we're pissed off, and we're not going to take it anymore. I feel like so many people are so angry and they don't know what to do with it. This is what happened with Occupy Wall Street and now with with all of this police brutality stuff. I really you can feel it coming from people. Just mm -hmm. one of the cool things about being involved is um, you're kind of your own media in the sense that you know you always get into conversations with people. Uh, I, I remember friends of mine, you know, three years ago, or whatever would be like, can you believe what's going on at, you know, Zuccotti? And, you know, they'd be against it, you know. Mm -hmm. And I, yeah. I would just kind of not talk and let them ramble, mm -hmm. you know, and spew some Fox crap and, mm -hmm. you know, some, some New York Post crap. And then I would speak up and say, well, you know, between my brother and I, we've been at the park every day since the occupation. So I can tell you, you know, it's not dirty hippies. It's not mm -hmm. uneducated you know, unemployed people. So, uh, but there definitely is an overlap. We see the same people that we saw, you know, three and a half years ago uh, at marches and rallies. Um, so these are these are people that woke up. Like, I, well, I consider myself. I won't speak for everybody, but I woke up when Occupy Wall Street took place. You know, I was not involved. 
I might, you know, send donations here, there, and everywhere, but, you know, I'm not really involved. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, I would agree. I think there's definite overlap. Um, and I think it, it, it's a movement of the oppressed, you know, whether that oppression strikes you because of debt, credit card debt, student debt, uh, mortgage uh, crisis because of predatory lending, or uh, being a, a person of color uh, in America where you have a target on your back all the time. Uh, these issues that are coming to the fore because now we have cameras in our pockets. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, if people had cell phones in the 50s, we would have seen lynchy, lynch, lynchings, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, so w what's happening is these things are, are, are coming out into the, into the daylight so that uh, a movement of the oppressed is really what's forming. Uh, you know, poor, it's poor people, it's people who, uh, y you know, the state, I guess, can oppress you, the, and capitalism, uh, this kind of perversion of capitalism that we have now, uh, you know, that even President Obama referred to in, in his State of the Union, uh, and has been talking about throughout his presidency, you know, income in inequality and all of these issues. Mm -hmm. uh, but also um, uh, mass incarceration and uh, LGBTQ who have been integral to, to this movement. Uh, in fact, I was told, I didn't realize that uh, three uh, queer women named the movement, uh, the Black Lives Matter okay. uh, in, in Ferguson. So yeah, you know, and Bayard Rustin who was a gay man that was integral to uh, the March on Washington, who was Dr. King's right-hand man, uh, was a gay man as well. So a lot of things that history forgets, mm -hmm. um, but I in this movement, uh, the oppressed have been front and center. Is I know one of the, I don't necessarily want to use the word flaws, but for lack of a better word, I'm going to say flaws, the, the lack of central organization with, within Occupy. It was a strength and a weakness. I think, do you, do you, do you find more um, stronger leadership now as, as the movement has evolved into Black Lives Matter? Black Lives Matter? Well, I mean, I, I find that to be like an interesting criticism that the, the press often levies. These are just citizens who are rising up, you know, uh, making incredibly valid points mm -hmm about the way the system is set up, you know. So there's this mass of bodies, this mass of souls uh, throughout the country saying the same things. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, if that's not organized, and if that's mm -hmm. not... Um, uh, organized, but not centrally organized, I think is, is, the, is the criticism that I hear. For sure, yeah. No, I mean, and it's valid, but I, I don't think, think it's... I think that scares people. Yeah, it's valid, but I don't think it's um, it, it, it's a sensible criticism because uh, these are just people who, you know, like Dr. King says that protest is the voice uh, of the voiceless. It's it's the act of the, the the powerless. You know, to go out into the streets. That's kind of a last resort. That's when you don't have economic power. Mm. You don't have uh, representation in government. You know, if government's been bought and paid for, so. Going into the streets is kind of an act of desperation, but mm -hmm. it's also an, an act of empowerment. Um, but it's also like you, you know, what you're saying is true that it, for it to change power, that has to then go to the legislative state and for laws to change, like the voting, the Voting Right Rights Act, uh, which is kind of central to the movie Selma now mm -hmm. and uh, Mississippi Freedom Summer. All those people, all those American citizens, nameless faceless, most of them, mm -hmm. who changed the course of history. And I think that's what's kind of what's going on now. Uh, and it's by no means over. It's almost kind of in the gestation Oh, it's period, not over. You know? mm -hmm. yeah. There was one night I was at the Time Warner Center. I was, um, I was at Whole Foods, and I was coming out, and I heard all this commotion. And there was a group of people, for, <clears throat> you know, protesters moving through the Time, excuse me, Time Warner Center. And I just looked up, and I have goosebumps now, and I just started laughing like because I was happy about it. You should have seen half the people were just like, oh, oh, 
you know, <laughs> and and then I'm waiting for the train home, and I wind up talking to this young woman who led the protest through the building, and so we started talking and struck up a friendship and started talking. I'm like, well, do you know Ted and Richie? And she's like, yeah. And it was just one of those moments, you know what wow. I mean? And it was so powerful and so wonderful, and you know what? I'm kicking myself in the ass. I should have had her come see if she could come tonight, too, and, and, and talk with you guys. Um, but, you know, it was just so wonderful because, I mean, on the Upper West Side and, and the Time Warner Center, uh, such a thing would happen. You know, it was fantastic. And I was just like, yes! Well, you, you would know? have loved to, We did a die-in at Saks. Oh, uh, I love reading <laughs> about that. Ago. Yes! <laughs> and it was just amazing, the, just the contrast. And one of our photographer friends got a great picture of this, you know, woman who was getting her face done by one of the makeup people and then you know there were like 100 200 bodies like laid out on the floor <laughs> right behind her oh she must have mm. shit her pants yeah, and there was I, there was a woman <laughs> behind me saying where is security can't they get these people out of here you know <laughs> oh, see that's somebody that doesn't get the point that doesn't understand i remember when september 11th happened a friend of mine overheard some woman saying well where i have a hair appointment where am I supposed to get my hair done now? Are you fucking kidding me? 3,000 people are vaporized and you're worried about your fucking hair? And, and, yeah. and that's the beauty of New York, too, that, I mean, he here really embodies the ultra-wealthy and the destitute mm -hmm. living side by side. It's so insane. New York, I think, has the greatest uh, wealth gap in, in the country. I think I read that, yeah. Mm. That's interesting. I know we're, we're talking a lot about what's going on now and what you're all involved in. Set a timeline for for the Black Lives Matter movement. The, the, go back to the spark. Well, I think the spark was in Ferguson when uh, Mike Brown, who was an 18-year-old uh, black boy, young man, who uh, was uh, pursued by Officer Darren Wilson and uh, shot and killed and his body was left in the street for four and a half hours um, and the officer Darren Wilson was not indicted uh, so you know an indictment indictment means that then it can at least be admitted to a court right uh, so in neither the Mike Brown case nor the Eric Brown case uh, was an indictment uh, secured um, so but as far as the timeline goes, I think that was the initial thing that uh, the people of Ferguson were outraged by the fact that this was so not blatant. Mm -hmm. not deemed worthy of being entered into a court of law to even further debate, like you know, the merits of like what what happened in the case. Because right. you heard varying things. You heard uh, he, he he was armed. He was not armed. People talked about that he stole cigar, uh, cigars from a store, uh, but the cop didn't even know that, so that mm. didn't really, that wasn't why he was pursuing him. Uh, he was jaywalking, and, right. so and depending on... It elevated this, and it elevated the discussion mm -hmm. in the public, you know, in a very public way. I guess it, in my opinion, it put a face on an existing problem. Well, you know, the other thing, too, with Ferguson, that also, like, took the, the lid off the can because when there was further investigation, that was when they found out that, like, what, half of the police force was fired um, for being racist. Or, it, I can't remember the details, but, like, all this stuff was coming out, you know, and it, they couldn't put the top back on all that. And not to mention, it, it's, it's systemic injustice, so you're not just talking about police policies. Mm being unjust or police you know police behavior or bad apples you're talking about the criminal justice system so even the prosecutor in that grand jury case mm -hmm. brought in a mentally ill woman as one of the witnesses who right. what the, who was uh, lying you know right. um, and he allegedly knew that she was lying right right so there's a whole bunch of things top to bottom that were kind of really um, I think symbolic of the ways in which the system is broken specifically for poor people of color. Mm -hmm. um, so to answer your question, I think that was definitely the spark. And credit really goes to the people of Ferguson for sustaining that for mm. whatever it's been now, 130 days, 140 <coughs> days. Uh, yeah. And then they, we were, they were out in the street every night. Right. And 
So, I mean, the rest of the nation really had, even with the crappy mainstream media that we have, um, people had to take notice and activists from all over the country went to Ferguson and were able to disseminate yeah, they what, couldn't, what was going they on. They couldn't bash people's heads because the whole country is like, hey, what's, what's going Everyone on over there? Everyone had a camera on them, yeah. Yeah, and, and like I say in, in, the, in the earlier clip that you showed, the, the, joke, the joke that I do, uh, you know, just because it's not a lot of people's experience, certainly that's not my experience as a white man with the police, but if I go five, not even five, if I go a mile from where I live, there's neighborhoods where that does go on and where people are stopped and frisked, are stopped in their mm -hmm. cars, are stopped while they're walking. Uh, so these are our fellow Americans, you know, so that's why I'm out there. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to say quickly that that was a revelation to me when I went, I saw Ted's panel. And, you know, I consider myself pretty socially aware, but I saw one black person after another on the panel talk about how many bad experiences they've had with the cops. And by bad, I mean guns in their face, mm. you know, cuffed, physically, you know, thrown on the ground. Um, and I was just like, wow. And I thought later on, you know, there's, there's a sense of, uh, there's a sense of shame, I guess, that goes along with it. They, they don't want to tell their story, but in that forum, they did tell their story, and it was so impactful. Those story, every I mean, so many people, so many of our friends have those stories. I was having a conversation with a friend of mine, and I won't go into the details, but he fit a description. And I mean, this is somebody I've known this man for 14 years now. I mean, that's beside the point. That doesn't even matter. He's a wonderful human being. But he told me he says. I was so scared. They didn't identify themselves as police officers. Somebody had a gun to his head, and he said, I ran because I figured if I got shot, my family would get some money. That's a really horrible oh. thing. Like, I have goosebumps, not in a good way. That's a horrible thing to have go through your mind. And, and you're just wa you're minding your own business walking down the street. Mm -hmm. And I mean, this, this is wrong. It's wrong. It's wrong, wrong, wrong. And, and, Something has to change. Like people who, who live in, in neighborhoods where they're constantly being stopped by the police, this is, they should not have to endure this. This is it's it's not right. I think it's terrorism, really, because if you have to, it is. if you have to live under those conditions mm -hmm. every day, and leave your house with the fear that, and, and like you said, unmarked car. Like somebody at the panel talked about an unmarked car hopping the curb, coming off stopping. Uh, this female comic, she was running to a show, and uh, she's um, lesbian and. She looks butch. She looks like a male. So she was running. Elsa. Uh, Elsa, yes. yeah. Yeah, Elsa was running. And a, an unmarked car hopped the curb, and she, like, ran into the car. And she had headphones in, so she thought it was a drunk driver, or she thought she was going to help the, the driver. Right. Saying, like, oh, my goodness, is this person okay? But then they came out with their guns drawn. You know, so, like, these, I mean, to me, I can't even fathom that. And to mm -hmm. me, I think, you know, like, words are important. And to me, that's terrorism. When you're terrorizing a community of people, who are guilty of nothing, who are unarmed, who are just going about their lives, that's terrorism. Mm -hmm. I think a, a, lot, a lot of it also is you know, inflamed by the militarization of the police forces. And if it's my understanding that, that um, the um, excess military equipment that, was, that's, that started being given to the police departments, yeah, it started under Bush II, but continued under Obama. And it's just it's just led to. Oh, they all want their toys. Yeah, the they toys have more crap than they know what to do with. It's the biggest business in America, basically, war, and militarization. But it's it's led to a level of terror, and even some of the some of the police officer friends that I know that I've came of age with, and they fully admit that the system is broken, and they themselves want something to be done that will allow them to effectively do their job and protect the people. Sure, sure. Yeah, because uh, that's a, such a good point, too, that, you know, it behooves them to fix a broken system, too, because they don't want to be the next Darren Wilson or Pantaleo, mm -hmm. you know, because they're put in a position where something goes wrong. So, you know, I think some of the reforms that are being discussed now, whether it's body cameras. Well, that's, that's a good first step, uh, is body cameras. And that was actually reiterated by a police officer friend of mine. So he, um, he would have probably not had to testify in a couple of different lawsuits because if he had had a body camera. 
Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And yeah, it's, it's a simple solution, well, a simple step that will help on both sides. Yeah, yeah. You know, I mean, it, it, it's an overwhelming kind of problem because it is systemic and because mass incarceration is profitable. You know, we have this for-profit prison system. Right. Michelle Alexander wrote a book called The New Jim Crow, which is a, a great book that really kind of puts it in its proper context of how there are more African-American males under uh, the criminal justice system now than there were enslaved in 1850. So it's this new way, you know, it went from slavery to peonage to kind of just sweeps where they would, you know, gather up black men for, you know, walking along a railroad track or, you know, you could criminalize anything back then. And uh, then Jim Crow was the next, and now this is, uh, as Michelle Alexander calls it, the new Jim Crow to, um, to oppress a population and profit off of it, you know, because these prisons, they've built a lot of prisons and they have to fill the beds. So disgusting. Mm. Did you see that Humans of New York? It was a snapshot of a young black man, um, a high school student, talking about his favorite teacher because, did you see? The last couple of days, that's really blown up. Oh my God! And he basically says she's my favorite teacher because she teaches us that we're going to be somebody and that we should we should educate ourselves because anytime what was it? Anytime we don't show up for school or or we fail out of school, a prison cell is being built. Hmm. Uh, Whoa! She, she she called each child to stand up one at a time and tell them that you matter. You yes. Matter. Yes. And she refers to them as scholars rather than uh, students. Mm -hmm. um, did you see the follow-up today? Because I think that got so much traction. Uh, this woman, Ms. Lopez, I believe was the principal, uh, she was so dynamic in articulating like the school's mission and the, the underserved population that's coming from really dire economic conditions. I think it's Brownsville, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, if you look on Humans of New York website, you'll, you'll see it. Um, but because of that post, uh, I think they, uh, the guy Brandon who runs that site um, did a fundraiser or, or posted something about being able to donate to the school and they've raised $185,000 for the school and for the kids to be able to go to, uh, I don't know if it's to Harvard yeah. that she wanted to take mm -hmm. them, just because the biggest obstacle for them is, is their world is so small mm. and so deprived uh, that travel was was the goal that they really articulated to to show them that the world is bigger than than where we are. So yeah, yeah the, the, power the goal of that. the goal was a hundred thousand, and they blew it away already, like within about five hours. So yeah. you know the beauty of that too is uh, we have a, an activist friend who's starting a school, uh, and I, I sent him the link because uh, I knew that it would be of interest to him. He called the school. And uh, he's going to meet with Miss Lopez as well. So, uh, you know, it's just an interesting dynamic now with the internet how immediate these things are. Because the, sc the schools he's the school he's setting up, he wants to maybe model on some of the things that she's doing. And I think Humans of New York is is such a great. Uh, well, I don't know what you w what you want to call it, a page. I guess most people have experienced it as a as a Facebook page. And I, I was thinking about it the other day. We we get so much negative news, you know mm -hmm. that. It's so great to, I really seek out that and uh, the photographs and I, I think that guy's, I don't know if I'm gonna go as far as to say he's a genius, but he's a great, <laughs> he's a great interviewer because it seems he'll ask, you know, these awesome questions that elicit these incredible, you know, a caption in one sentence can be like, oh my God, that's, you know, so effective. And yeah. the, the photo of that young man and, oh, it was really, really, really well done. I think what that page does is I mean, it seems obvious to say, but it, it humanizes the people of New York uh, because that's the New York that we all know. That's the New York that we all see walking down mm -hmm. the streets. We see the faces. We see the stories in mm -hmm. people's eyes. We pass one another. But he stops and asks these folks, and he shows everyone. He shows the New York that we're talking about, the, ri the wealthiest wealthy mm -hmm. and, and the folks who are disadvantaged. And he shows them both, and, and they both just have their platform. Um, and it's really pretty radical in a way 
because in media we don't really see both of those they don't get equal voices mm -hmm. no. you know i mean in the academy awards there's been that that kind of uh controversy about how it's 93 percent white the voting mm -hmm. and 77 percent male so uh you know j just to illustrate where our media is coming from mm -hmm. generally and who's making decisions on what is valued and whose voices are valued uh, humans of New York values everyone's voices. You know what I especially like about that, and, and 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 I like that things like this pick up speed and traction, like you had said, is that this equalizes all of us. And if we can remember in one small way, looking at humans of New York, something like that, that we are all connected and we can start caring about each other and we can make changes and stop all this crap that's going on and, and these injustices against our fellow people, you know, I'm, maybe that's idealistic of me, but I mean, if you can just take a moment, you know, and and realize that the person sitting across from you on the train has a story, you know, they have hopes, fears, dreams, they felt the sun on their face, you know. That's actually that's one of my favorite things to do is just yeah. To, just as I as I people watch when I'm on the train, it's like if, if someone has just a particular look about them, I try and imagine imagine their story. I mean, it's just. But you feel Something like I, I feel like my heart softening towards people when I see them, and I don't want anything bad to happen to people. You know, like they don't deserve people don't deserve the shitty things that have happened because of X, Y, and Z. Um, but I, I love that Humans of New York. It's so good. It's I, so good. I also feel like it illustrates the way that the system is set up to not provide solutions, but to pit us against each other and also bog things down. Yeah. And see how easy this solution is. He posts a picture. People respond to it. They want to raise money, and they get one hundred eighty-five thousand dollars. People like want to do good people things. People want to do good things, mm -hmm. and we have the resources. We want to help one another. So yeah, I mean it, that's another like compelling aspect of that page that just reminds me like we want to help one another. We want to see that everyone is cared for and has the basic necessities and thrives and has opportunity. You know. So yeah, that that. But then the a, mainstream media will slap a label on it like socialism or this or that, and then shut off people's minds to mm -hmm. good things that are happening. Mm -hmm. That drives me crazy. Yeah, and <laughs> yeah, the, the the loudest voice in the mainstream media is is coming from the right. They they point the finger at everyone else, saying that's the mainstream media, but they're the highest rated. So who's really more mainstream if they're if they currently have the most viewers? Oh, we're not mainstream, but our ratings are better. Hello. That's right. But see, th I, I think that comes to another basic point that all these things are in place to keep us pitted against one another and not soften and mm -hmm. open our hearts to one another. I went to um, uh, a Shabbat service last week with a friend of mine who had invited me because she, another comic, you probably know. Um, it, we had this conversation, and she she invited me. It was all inclusive and. I have to tell you, I had never done anything like that, and it was amazing and beautiful. And um, there were two rabbis, the uh, man and a woman, and the the man gave the sermon. And this guy was amazing. Like I want to go back just to hear him talk, but he was talking about um, the names of God, like why that's a big deal. Like you know, why, what's the big deal about naming God, the name of God, this, that, and that. But his point was, well. He was reading from a book of poetry by this, this rabbi, I can't remember his name, but he was saying that, well, I have a new word for the name of God, it's called human being. And he was equating um, what happened in uh, France with that massacre, he was saying, so the people that are saying you're blaspheming God, they just blaspheme 12 names of God, saying that basically all of us are a name of God. And, you know, the right wing in this country using their God to take away the rights of LGBT, people of color, whatever, so you're blaspheming those names of God. And it was such an interesting way of equalizing everybody. And if you can look at it that way, that we truly are all equal. It was, it was amazing. I, I was just so blown away, away by this man. And you don't hear about that stuff in like mm -hmm. mainstream. But, the, but yet here in New York, we're finding these pockets of people, like-minded people that, you know, we're all in this together, and, th and that's what's powerful. And I think that scares the shit out of some people. They're afraid, and that's why I think those right-wing folks are just so nuts because they're scared. You know, I don't know. I'll get off my high horse now. <laughs> this guy was amazing. He was just so good, and he had a nice singing voice. So I don't know. <laughs>
Yeah, well, I, I think, you know, those opportunities to be together are really the most powerful mm -hmm. tool that we have, you know. When people are struggling as much as they are, you know, and people are working two jobs or three jobs or, you know, just tr trying to make ends meet, uh, those moments where we can connect are really the only thing we have a a at times, you know. Um, so I, I see real value in that and, you know, like the panel discussion that we had, like we didn't know, like, you know, like, like you were saying earlier, like, well, what's the ultimate goal, you know? I always think, like, you have to start with the first step. You just mm. have to be, to be together and talk about it. Because I think, you know, as Americans, and I think this was true of 9-11 as well, we're so quick to get to the solutions mm. that we don't grieve. You know, like these things, you need to grieve. And when you skip steps of grieving, uh, it's going to have repercussions. So you have to go through the stages of grieving. Uh, and I think, you know, that's true whether you're talking about a personal loss or something like 9-11 or something like the Black Lives Matter movement. Uh, it's, it's essentially grieving. And part of grieving is, is talking, you know. Mm -hmm. so, so in that panel discussion, one of the things that I found most interesting was Mark DeMeo, the police officer, he wrote a piece about his experience of that night. And he said, I went in expecting to school these liberals about what it's really like, what real life is like, what being a cop is like. He's like, but when I heard one person after another telling their story, I, sto I stopped and I, and I listened and I really realized that these were my colleagues. Mm. These weren't criminals or thugs or blah, blah, blah. These were human beings, my colleagues, my fellow comedians who were uh, experiencing these things. And I realized that the police department has to make changes and has to reconnect with the community that it's protecting and serving. Uh, so I thought that was really powerful. And, and in a way, it made me so grateful that we took the time to just get together and talk. Mm -hmm. Because if you change one person like that, right. or if you connect and, and internalize someone else's perspective, uh, y you stop and think the next time. Right. As long as you're also, you know, you're not just willing to talk, you're willing to listen. Yeah. And that's, that's another thing that not enough people do. You know, they just you know, spew their point of view, but, but the ears aren't open, or you know, the, the words are going right through, and it's not sinking in. Yeah. I, I think it's unfortunate, too, that that's kind of the prominent dynamic on most of the shows mm -hmm. we see. It's going to be a battle. It's going to be combat. One person's going to win. One person's going to lose. Instead mm -hmm. of a dialogue, like, tell me how you feel. Tell me what you're thinking. You know, here's what I think, you know. Right. And I didn't, I didn't see the segment, but while all this was going on, just uh, Rosie and Whoopi on The View. Just um, What happened? Well, <laughs> let me tell you. No. I don't watch TV, so I don't know <laughs> what happened. But th they were discussing racism, and, and Whoopi uh -oh. supposedly told Rosie that she didn't know what racism was because because she's Caucasian, you know, because she's white. And the the disagreement was, she, I I think this, I didn't actually see the segment, so I'm just I'm talking sh anyway. <laughs> it, because she didn't experience it, she didn't know what it was. Yeah, just, but in my opinion, just because you don't experience it doesn't mean you don't know what it is. It's just your, your perspective on it is different because while you may know what it is and you may have seen it, you haven't necessarily had the, the full brunt of it. And, you know, where this very segment is kind of guilty of that also, poor Caucasians talking about racism on, on, on television. Yeah. I'm the executive producer, so it all comes back to me. And you know, if I want to put it out there, www.talkingabout.info is our website. And we are on Facebook at facebook.com slash talking about. Reach out to us, have a discussion with us, and present your point of view in a way that we will invite you here to sit on this couch with us and have a further dialogue. So let me put that out there. It's important, because it's like what we've been saying all, all the whole time. This isn't going away. No, and, and also uh, a lot of Americans think like, oh wow, this is a this is something new, you know, <laughs> just because it's on video, and uh, well, you look know, at that. we're talking about four hundred years here, you know. Mm. So, well, I went home for uh, was it Thanksgiving? I th I think it was Thanksgiving. My father 
was a police officer and um, at one time and he just we all we I grew up in the house where we always discuss like current events and stuff at the dinner table and so it was just me and my mom and my dad and he says so um what do you think about uh, this this Eric Garner case and it was really funny because my dad he did listen to me and I didn't even think about like the cop part of him like he really wanted to know my opinion and I swear to God there was food I was spitting food I got so <laughs> animated and like it was so interesting because my father was just like wow wow you know I had no because they don't it, this was in outside of the city and and he was just like he had no idea about the stuff that was coming out of his child's mouth because it's not reported and you know he's like well that's wrong you know and this and my mother just sat there and they were like wow but you know I wish there were more people like my dad because he wanted to know what my opinion was and he listens and I'm sure I changed some thoughts that you know, preconceived notions that he might have had you know and and uh, so then we start we started a dialogue you know and that dialogue continued when I went to see them for Christmas we started we were talk we were continued talking about this and it was really amazing because I mean he had some very thoughtful things to say and I wish I mean, I don't know. I feel like we're we're spoiled living on either the East Coast or the West Coast, and then there's in between, you know. But I don't want to write off those folks either. That's not right. But um, these dialogues can happen with anybody. It doesn't matter as long as we get talking about this stuff. That's how things are going to change. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, I think again, <gasps> the media is perhaps the most potent arm of this system uh, because the media. Uh, shapes the narrative and said, mm -hmm. says the discussion will take place in this alley here despite the fact of what you're saying uh, there's plenty of opinions uh, outside of that alley and uh, like these types of issues call for nuanced discussion they don't call for black or white quick solutions mm -hmm. it calls for nuanced discussion and like you said earlier listening um, and and it's unfair to paint the police with one brush as well mm -hmm. uh, because uh, you know as you're talking about with your dad and with Mark DeMeo the, the comedian I mentioned earlier uh, you know cops have plenty of opinions too differing opinions but the media will put forth this narrative that it's the cops versus the protesters mm -hmm. it's the cops versus de Blasio um, when in fact it's it's not but they're held to this kind of uh, and I think it's detrimental, this, this wall of silence, this blue wall of silence, uh, where they don't have a voice, and mm -hmm. they can't voice their opinion. And I, quite honestly, I think it leads to more dead bodies and, and more injustices because they're not able to, um, because there are plenty of cops that have opinions. And I, and I feel badly f that they can't express them, and they can't have uh, an mm -hmm. open town hall discussion or a panel discussion, because think, you know, the same way that that thing was solved in 10 minutes uh, on Humans of New York? Yeah. Not mm -hmm. that this would be solved in 10 minutes, but if you get people in a room really talking, I I'm sure that uh, solutions would come and, and dialogue would, would start towards healing and start towards answers. But that's the last thing that they, that they, they you know, the powers that be want. They want the combat and they want the mm -hmm. uh, us against them. They want the Pat Lynch's of the world with with that kind of divisive rhetoric um, mm -hmm. you know they don't want even the cop I mean that that's causing uh, schism have you been reading about uh, that last union meeting like they got into like almost fisticuffs yeah and so there was some guy who's gonna run against Pat Lynch because he hasn't been questioned and you know hasn't he's well, been he's, unopposed he's been, yeah he, well he's been sitting as the cherry on top of that mound for as long as I can remember. But, and but this is all like even that's gonna that's gonna change the union leadership within the uh, with the Patrolman's Benevolent Association. That's gonna probably change. People are like e even the cops want change. You know, it's mm -hmm. it's powerful stuff. Yeah, and and uh, another thing that I thought was telling was uh, I think it was the Post ran a front page story. Cops tell De Blasio, "Don't come to our funerals." And you know it was such a distortion of what was r really going on. Uh, Four percent of officers signed that. Right, Pat Lynch <laughs> uh, with the PBA, uh, Police, Police Benevolent Association, put out a form on <laughs> their website saying you can sign this, and like you said, I think four percent mm -hmm. actually did sign it. Right. Um, but that becomes the headline that. Well, with a police department of 
40,000, which is more than the citizenship of some cities. 4% is a significant number, but it's still 4%. Mm -hmm. It's not worthy of a, a front page story, I don't think. You no, know. that's just more of what you were talking about, like keeping being divisive and not offering solutions and and just keeping people, you know, mixing it up. Mm -hmm. it makes absolutely no sense to me. Mm. I don't know. I, I just keep I keep reflecting back on why I never pursued a career in law enforcement. Is I never wanted to have to make that decision, that split second decision, that could mean life or death, and be the wrong decision. I never wanted to have somebody else's life in my hand like that. And I do have the empathy of the, the officer or the, anyone in, in that position, whether or not they you know, make the right decision, wrong decision, and somebody's life is in the balance. It's, it's a tough place to be in, and I do respect that position. But if there's a mistake made, or own it, step up, be, be better. And this, through all of this, just going back those you know twenty some odd years, making that career choice, not to move in that direction, just keeps coming back to me. And I know <laughs> more and more that that was the right choice for me. <laughs> Unfortunately, I don't think it's that much of a choice for a lot of people. You had options, mm -hmm. right? But when I, uh, it's so easily now. Uh, I, when I think of the cops, I think about the military. They're almost mm -hmm. interchangeable for me at this point. And I just think there are so many 18-year-olds that don't really have that many options. And they wind up, as police officers, they wind up in the armed forces, mm -hmm. you know? And there's no way that we should just lump them together, like we're saying. They're, you know, they're all of one mind. Forty thousand, you know, of one mind. You know, how how is that possible? Um, and I just think they're they're almost cannon fodder. Some of these cops, and you know, like, like I know from being at at protests. You know, mm -hmm. let's throw these, you know, young guys uh, on the front line so they can get cursed at, you know, mm -hmm. and get all the crap. And guys like you know Pat Lynch are eating filet mignon, uh, you know, in some nice restaurant at the same time. Well, I think it was last time you were here, uh, one of you was talking about the early days of Occupy and just that their relationship with the police at that point it was and how it changed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in the early days of Occupy, I mean, I was there the third day, September 19th, 2011, and uh, at that point, it, it wasn't masses of people. It was starting to grow, uh, and there were cops there, but you could engage in discussion with the police and talk about the issues and they even agreed and they said yeah you know you're out here for us too because uh, we're up for a contract and you know our pensions are at risk and all of these types of issues so in those early days it was really fascinating the way it was almost like we were on the same side but then they must have received some sort of order from the top down saying do not engage with the protesters uh, don't have any conversations because you saw a distinct difference where they disengaged mm. and um, there was an us against them type of dynamic set up uh, and it was more you know militaristic and mm. not accessible and yeah so and and you know that's by design uh, like Rich alluded to those are orders that come because they don't they don't want sympathetic officers mm -hmm. or, or officers who are thinking for themselves or thinking as human beings in the uniform you know it just, uh, here's the job and, and follow the orders. Be a good soldier. Yeah. Yeah, when you have 40,000 cops, obviously, you know, they're getting uh, evaluated all the time. Mm -hmm. So the cops that might be the narrow-minded bullies, those are the ones that do the, you know, for example, storm the park at 2 o'clock in the morning and raise everything and throw away the the library um, you know and of course none of it was reported by mainstream media mm. but that's what happened and it's got to be hard too like you know I just saw the movie Selma a couple of weeks ago and uh, you see these police officers on the bridge there that are given the order order to beat and you know uh, gas and um, you know uh, terrorize th these civilians uh, and, and the same thing was going on in Ferguson with tear gas and rubber mm -hmm. bullets and you know so here we are uh, 50 years later and the same things 
are going on. But I, I was I was looking at the faces of police officers in like old stock footage, and just wondering like you know these were fathers and sons as well you know going to and from work, wanting to get home alive, um, following orders right. you know. Um, so yeah, it's just such a fascinating dynamic of these lives that are, are, are you know, uh, taken, swept up by like the, 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 the waves of, of history. And uh, you know, you wonder like, will it ever end? Will, will, will that divide, will, it, will you put down, put down your swords? <laughs> or will we keep repeating ourselves over and over again? Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. I, I would hope that we would evolve <laughs> enough to Hopefully. put oh, things down. In, in, in the last uh, minute or so, um, where can people learn more and do more? Uh, well, I would say um, Ferguson. Uh, the Ferguson movement has a Tumblr page. So if you look up Ferguson... I think it's just if you look up Ferguson Tumblr, you'll see they have a listing of all the events that are going on nationally. Um, uh, D. Ray is someone to follow on on Twitter. He's on the front lines. Okay. He's someone that I've been following. Uh, and Netta is another name. So those are two people. They're citizen journalists that are out there giving you uh, the truth. You know, so Twitter is where a lot of kind of the underground things mm -hmm. come to the fore and get spread uh, that way. Um, the Root is always good. Um, popularresistance.org has a lot about. Uh, I, I wrote a piece about an action that we did at Grand Central Station, um, and Popular Resistance picked that up. So, yeah, you know, there's plenty of places mm -hmm. to kind of tie in and to, uh, to participate. Okay. And, um, well, where can people find out more about the two of you? Uh, please feel free to friend me on Facebook. <laughs> I, like we've been saying, conversation is mm -hmm. uh, key, you know, and I'm always willing to have a conversation uh, with anybody as long as it is civil, and I try to remain civil. Um, yeah, and I would, I would just encourage, you know, if you're a New Yorker, you probably know somebody who's active. In, in some cause, you know. Okay. Um, I, I know that when I got involved with it's Occupy Wall seconds, Street. So. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so basically, get involved with somebody who is involved already, mm -hmm. and they'll let you know what kind of actions are going on. Okay. And your website is? TedAlexandro.com. Okay. And you can find more about us at www.talkingabout.info. I'm John Griffith. I'm Kara Gildoff. Come back and discuss this Thank again. Thank you so much, you Thank guys. you, and we'll see you next time. about